This is BBC Bite Size with Chris Smith and Ben Vausler. We're from the Naked Scientists. In this podcast, we're exploring how forces make things move. So, Ben, first off, what actually is a force? Well, a force is a push or a pull, something which will affect how an object is moving. We measure forces in newtons. So how does a force actually affect an object? A force will change an object's velocity. It makes it accelerate in the direction that the force is acting in. Like velocity, a force has a direction as well as a strength. So if I push a heavy shopping trolley, I'm applying a force to it, and then it accelerates. That's right, yes. It will accelerate in the direction of the force. So what happens if you then apply a force to something that's already moving? Well, exactly the same thing. It will accelerate in the direction of the force. Now, depending on the direction of the force, it may speed the object up, slow it down, or just change its direction. So if my notional shopping trolley is moving and I pull on it, am I applying a force then that will slow it down? Yes, you're applying a force in the opposite direction to its motion, so it will accelerate in the opposite direction to its velocity and its speed will reduce. Of course, if the trolley accelerates for long enough in that direction, it will stop and then start moving in the other direction. Now, from my experience of shopping trolleys, the more shopping I have actually in the trolley, the harder they are to then start and stop. Yes, that's right. The more shopping you have, the more mass you have in your trolley. And a bigger mass needs more force to get the same acceleration. And the more I push, the bigger the acceleration I give. Yes, that's right. The bigger the force, the larger the acceleration. In fact, these two ideas combine into a single equation. Acceleration equals force divided by mass. OK, so to give us an example. How quickly would myself on my bike, which weighs, say, 100 kilograms, accelerate if I were to attach a rocket onto it, which gives it a push at 300 newtons? Well, then the acceleration would be 300 newtons divided by 100 kilograms, so 3 metres per second squared. So after one second, you'd be moving at 3 metres per second. After two seconds, it would be 6 metres per second, and so on. Now, that sounds a bit scary. What if I only wanted to accelerate at one metre per second every second, so one metre per second squared? How big a force would I then need? Well, all you need to do is rearrange the formula. If acceleration equals force over mass, then we multiply both sides by mass and get mass times acceleration equals force. We often shorten this to F equals MA to save the writing. So if the mass is 100 kilograms and the acceleration we want is 1 metre per second per second, in other words 1 metre per second squared, the force I would need would be 100 times 1, so that's 100 N. Exactly right. Can you have more than one force acting on an object at once? Yes, you can, and actually this happens most of the time. All the forces add up to give a resultant force, but because forces have a direction, how they add up will depend on their direction. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, if I had a toy car which was being pushed forward by the motor with a force of 3 newtons, and the wind was behind it and pushing it along with a force of 2 newtons, both forces are acting in the same direction. So the resultant force will add together, will be 3 newtons plus 2 newtons is 5 newtons, and the car will accelerate quite quickly quickly. So that's if the forces are working in the same direction. But what happens if they're actually working in two different directions? If the car turned around and was driving into the wind, the engine would still be pushing it with three newtons and the wind still with two newtons, but now they'd be pushing in opposite directions and so the two forces would be fighting one another. The resultant force would be the difference between them. Three newtons minus two newtons gives you one newton. And what about if they were exactly equal so they cancelled each other out? Well, it'll just behave like there's no forces acting on it at all, so it'll keep going with the same speed and direction. So does this mean that if my car isn't accelerating, all of the forces on it must be cancelling each other out? Yes, that's right. If your car doesn't accelerate, the force from the wheels pushing it forwards must be exactly the same, but in the opposite direction as the drag force or air resistance from the car, plus any other forms of friction that are pulling it back. What about gravity? Well, likewise, gravity is always acting on an object, and as all the forces must cancel out, the gravity pushing the car down must be exactly the same as the contact force from the ground pushing it up. And what's contact force? Well, if you push two solid objects together, they'll push straight back just like a very stiff spring. This is what stops you falling through the floor. So when a car has a crash, it must change its speed very rapidly. Yes, it does, and this is what makes crashes so dangerous. Because things are stopping very quickly, they must have very large accelerations, and to achieve this, there must be huge forces, because, as we said earlier, force equals mass times acceleration. So would it make cars safer if they were to decelerate less quickly in a crash. Yes, and that's exactly what the car designers are trying to achieve. They build crumple zones in the front of the car so it slows down more slowly over a greater distance, although the most dangerous acceleration in any car is the large accelerations on your head. 
And what does that mean? Well, if your head has to slow down very quickly, for example, due to hitting the steering wheel or the dashboard, the accelerations will be immense and the resulting huge forces will throw your brain around inside your head. This could cause bruising or even bleeding inside your skull and maybe even break your skull. Is there anything that we can do about that? Well, if you wear a seatbelt and have airbags fitted to your car, your head will probably decelerate at a similar rate to the car, which is high, but not as ridiculously fast as your head would do if it hit something hard, so you're much more likely to survive a crash.